we'd like to begin our uh, program this afternoon uh, by prayer. So I'll, I invite you to join me in bowing your heads as we pray. Father, thank you again for your watch care and your blessings. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to know you and the pardoning of our sins. Thank you for the privilege of being servant leaders during a time like this. Now, Father, as we come together to learn and to sharpen our tools, we pray that you would be with us uh, during this uh, webinar. Bless our presenter in a very special way. And we're so grateful for all of those who are on the line today. Be with us and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Well, we're very happy to have each one of you this afternoon for this uh, second session of our virtual elders retreat. Uh, this is, as you know, one of the highlight events of the calendar year for Allegheny East. And, uh, Unfortunately, we are unable to uh, be together in terms of uh, gathering in person, but uh, this event is just so important that we didn't want to miss it. And we're thanking God for technology so that we can at least have an opportunity to uh, meet virtually. Uh, before we uh, continue with our program, uh, we're going to ask our president, Elder Henry J. Fordham, if he would uh, give us a word of greetings. I don't know if you can see me. I'm on the phone. I couldn't get my computer going. We want to say greetings to all of our local elders. Good to see you, Dr. Wilson. Uh, we got the best of the best uh, this evening, and we thank you for taking out of your vigil, uh, vi excuse me, busy schedule to share with us. You know, Dr. Donaldson, that. Uh, uh, even though we call this a retreat, maybe during this time, this pandemic time, we should have called it an advance, an attack. We're not retreat from anything. <laughs> <laughs> we're fighting harder than we've ever fought before. And I think the elders that are joining us, they would, they would uh, agree with me that we're working harder than we've ever worked before in order to keep connection and to encourage our flock. So we certainly want to thank the elders for having the presence of mind in order to come online with us that we can pick up some more weapons that we can fight the devil and his company. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Mr. President. And I think, uh, I think your uh, words are very apropos. So we, I, I want to uh, welcome again all of our elders to our uh, virtual uh, advance, not our virtual retreat. And we're grateful for your presence this uh, afternoon. Well, uh, last night, if you were with us last night uh, in our first uh, opportunity to uh, be together in this forum, we had a wonderful time together as uh, our presenter, uh, Dwayne Esmond, shared with us some salient points from uh, of the spirit of prophecy or Ellen White as a part of the spirit of prophecy, as he shared with us. Uh, he talked about uh, <clears throat> her uh, statements concerning pandemics. He talked about uh, the importance that she placed on um, uh, race relationships and that she wanted in a very special way to make sure that this church was conscious of uh, its responsibility uh, to uh, people of color. She, he talked about a number of our pioneers who were on the forefront of the abolitionist movement. And then he gave us some uh, great tools uh, regarding the use and misuse of uh, uh, Mrs. White's writings. So we're just excited about uh, uh, what um, he was able to do. Today, uh, we believe, will be no exception. Uh, we've got an outstanding presenter to come to us, to share with us um, on some ways in which we can sharpen our tools as leaders, particularly during this uh, crisis uh, time. 
Before I introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Wilson, I'm going to ask our communications director, uh, Latasha Hewitt, to come on and provide us with a few uh, housekeeping tips. And then I will introduce our speaker, loose him and let him go. Thank you. Good afternoon again, everyone. Once again, we'd like to say welcome to our virtual elders advance. Uh, same, same announcements from last night. Uh, we just want to make sure that you keep your mic, mics muted during the entire presentation. Uh, we are videotaping this. We are recording it for future use. And so, as you know, whoever uh, picks up noise, you become the main speaker. So we want to make sure that our speaker's picture is there the whole time. Also, uh, many have asked when this will be available, the recording. Both should be available by Monday. Our media team has been working around the clock, so they are not on duty this weekend, but we will make sure you have um, both, both recordings by Monday. Also yesterday, um, Alder Esmond shared that he had some information on voting rights, and he did share with me that link. I'm gonna put it in the chat, just for those who have a um, computer right now, can uh, click on it and save it, but I'll also email it to make sure everyone gets it. Um, we will allow for questions at the end. So if during Dr. Wilson's presentation, you have a question you don't wanna forget, just put it in the chat and we'll do like we did last night and address those questions at the end of his presentation. That's all, thank you. Thank you, uh, Latasha, for uh, sharing those uh, tidbits with us. And now brothers and sisters, my fellow servants, uh, I have the distinct pleasure of being able to uh, introduce uh, not only a colleague, but a friend of mine for many, many years in the person of Dr. Jesse Wilson. Dr. Jesse Wilson is a native of Memphis, uh, Tennessee. Uh, he's a graduate of Oakwood University, Andrews University, and he has received a doctorate in ministry from Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. Dr. Jesse Wilson uh, brings a, a wealth of experience uh, and uh, has been a great blessing uh, to our church, both at large and in whatever uh, conference that he has served. Uh, he has been a successful pastor in Tennessee and Alabama and in Southern California. Uh, Dr. Wilson has also been a frontline person when it has come to social justice issues. Uh, he's been a major spokesman in California for police misconduct. And uh, he was awarded one of the first Adventists to ever receive the historic one California award from the state of California for his community service and his work in the social justice area. Dr. Wilson has also served as the director of church growth and discipleship for the Southeastern California Conference. And he has poured back into uh, the young men and young ladies who've been interested in going to our theological seminary as he served as the coordinator of doctoral ministries with the concentration in urban ministries. Uh, currently, Dr. Wilson is the director of the Bradford Cleveland Brooks Leadership Center at Oakwood University. And he also serves as the director of the uh, PELC conference that you may have heard of, the Pastor Evangelism and Leadership uh, Council that is uh, held annually at Oakwood University. It's one of the largest and longest running ministers conference in our denomination. I have the uh, pleasure of uh, sitting on the, uh, that committee and he is our, our leader. We are just so thankful that uh, Dr. Wilson could take a time out of his busy schedule to be able to uh, share with us he has a great passion for uh, leadership and particularly leadership that affects the local church and uh, is a well-known uh, speaker throughout the United States and the world, uh, particularly focusing on how 
to uh, ignite and empower and engage uh, our local leadership, particularly those who are elders. We are grateful for uh, his presence. We're looking forward to what he has to share with us. And I know that we're all are going to be blessed. And so, uh, Dr. Jess, man, thanks again for uh, consenting to uh, participate and make this uh, uh, virtual advance uh, a, a effective and memorable one. Appreciate you and uh, always uh, thank you so much for what you have done. And my right now is your time. My pleasure, my pleasure. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It is a, uh, a blessing to uh, be with Allegheny East again. And I uh, appreciate the invitation. Um, I love Allegheny East. God must have thought an awful lot of you all to give you the group of leaders that you have. And uh, Dr. Donaldson is, as he said, not only a colleague, but a great friend. And I was thinking, man, he's, I'm getting older. These introductions are getting longer. I don't know where. <laughs> <laughs> and Pastor Fordham, great man of God. I was about to call Lawrence Pastor Lawrence, but I don't think he's reached that point yet. And uh, the VP for finance, uh, Lawrence Martin, great, great man. And of course, Pete Palmer, friend and a co-worker, so I'm excited to be with uh, you today. Um, I want to, let me just go ahead and share this screen now so I can set up some things. Uh, yeah, let's get it. There we go. I want to uh, just again look at how we can be more effective local elders in this new normal. And uh, there's some incredible things that are going on, as uh, Dr. Donaldson said. Some of us have been involved in the streets, um, dealing with issues of police misconduct and, and uh, social justice, as have many of you for years. And I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, a sense of what has gone on uh, recently here in Huntsville and certainly in California. But we pray that the Lord would bless us as we look at how we as local elders can become more effective in this new normal. But let's go ahead and pray first. Father, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath. We are not worthy, but we've got sense enough when someone does something for us to say thank you. Thank you for waking us up. Thank you for keeping us up. Now stir our gifts, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. You know, I'm looking outside. It is a blessing to work on the campus of Oakwood University. I'm looking at Adventist Boulevard. It's a beautiful day in Huntsville. We want you to pray for our um, campus. You know, it's not only a new normal for uh, local churches, but it's certainly a new normal for universities. And so we anticipate opening in August. We anticipate our graduation uh, in the end of uh, July, but we want you to pray for us, your university, Oakwood University. Let's look at um, how we can become more effective as local elders in this new normal. So let's frame this against the backdrop of some characteristics of effective elders in this new normal. Now, I know that we're going to field questions at the end such as, such as they are. I do a lot of these webinars and sometimes there are questions, sometimes there aren't questions. Uh, either way is fine with me. And uh, Dr. Donaldson, if you or uh, Sister Hewitt feel a need to just break in with a pressing question as I move forward. I don't have a problem with that either. But this is one of the characteristics that I think we need to understand in this new normal, that effective local elders understand the times. I should have put that in quotes, understand the times. Many of you understand that to be a characteristics of the sons of Issachar in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 13, and it tells us that they were effective in leading Israel because they understood what was going on. And so we are in a totally new normal. To be perfectly honest, there ain't been nothing new, new about this normal for a long time. Normal about this new, normal about this old. We have been in a shifting context, a shifting paradigm, as people are uh, of, uh, uh, often saying and describing the church as being a part of a shifting par paradigm. It's a whole new normal, but COVID-19 has done nothing other than to accelerate 
uh, issues that we've already been dealing with. I wrote some of them down here. Even before COVID-19, we were dealing with shrinking churches. That's certainly not the case. Everywhere might not be uh, characteristic of your local church, but certainly here in South Central and uh, across this division, we see a number of our churches, especially our legacy, legacy churches, our institutional churches, shrinking. Not only have we been dealing with prior to, uh, and certainly during this pandemic, shrinking churches, but we're dealing with the reality that most of our pastors, including myself, are significantly closer to retirement than ordination, if you know what I mean. Pastors are getting old, and there's going to be a significant turnover in the next few years, and we're beginning to see it already. But the challenge that we're wrestling with is against the backdrop of shrinking churches, aging pastors, retiring quickly. We don't have the number of uh, prospective interns or prospective pastors entering the pastoral ministry at the clip that we need them to, to replenish the ranks. And that uh, is true for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is historically, it has been challenging for some of our uh, graduates to find employment. And that has taken its toll. Others have over the last few years found greener pastors in uh, the chaplaincy. And I think that's a good thing. I think at Oakwood, I am literally amazed at the number of incoming freshmen who are moving or have already decided to move not toward the pastoral ministry, but toward the chaplaincy, a corporate chaplaincy, um, uh, athletic chaplaincy, some of them certainly chaplaincy in the armed services, chaplaincy in the healthcare industry. There are a lot more opportunities open to and available to our young men and women than pastoral ministry, which was actually at one time the exclusive option. And so we've got shrinking churches, disappearing pastors, I should say disappearing interns, aging pastors. But I've seen in this uh, a silver lining because it is forcing us, I believe, to go back to the future. It is forcing us to recognize that our um, future is directly tied into our ability to engage those who don't receive a paycheck from the conference office. We're going to have to do a much better job of identifying, equipping, motivating, engaging, and training uh, local elders and local, el uh, and local leaders in our churches. And that's why I so appreciate your interest, your willingness on a Sabbath. And let me tell you something, I've never seen so many online services in my life. And so I know you could have been anywhere looking at any kind of program. You got the Quarantine Revival. You got Van Dion Griffin doing some with the young people. You got conference camp meetings. So you got a lot of stuff going on. And the fact that you are here uh, really signifies, it symbolizes, it says that you are intentional about being equipped. And so the first characteristic that I would raise today of effective local elders is that effective local, local elders are children of their context. They know what's going on in their communities. They sense what's going on in their local churches. They're connected in a way that allows them to navigate this new normal by knowing what's going on. They know what uh, the time it is or what time it is. But let's move. Not only are effective uh, local elders uh, those who understand the times, but effective local elders have always prioritized ministry development. By ministry development, I mean you have been given a responsibility at your local church, a weighty responsibility, an important responsibility to serve as a local elder. And I think given that responsibility, you understand the stewardship that is your responsibility. And so you need to develop. Local elders need to develop. And you're prioritizing that by your presence here today. Look at what uh, is said here in Ecclesiastes 10.10. 10. If the ax is dull and its edge or the edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill 
will bring success. If I was preaching, I'd say, touch your neighbor and say skill. I can't say that, though. Uh, skill, skill will bring success. And what is skill? Skill is the application of knowledge. Skill is your, your ability to take those, those training events that you have uh, taken advantage of, to begin to internalize those principles that you've been taught through webinars like this, and the ongoing training that you're receiving through Dr. Donaldson's office and develop a skill set that will translate into your being a more effective elder where you are. The, pro the point is, and this is not a problem that is exclusive to local elders. There are a whole lot of folk working hard, but not as many folk working smart. And you can totally exhaust your energy if you're hitting at something with a dull ax. That's the imagery of that text. That's the symbolism of that text. Not only do you need to work with energy, but you also need to make sure that you are tooled correctly. Y'all miss what I just said. You got to have the right tools. And the reason right tools are effective is because in this context, you need to have more than one approach to get to the same destination. I said something right there. Let me say it again. You got to have more than one, uh, one chart or one way to get at the same destination because things are changing so rapidly. Um, it comes to me when I was in California, I would go to the Staples Center. That's when... Uh, the Lakers were there. The Clippers weren't there, but I would go to see the Lakers in uh, in, in L.A. Uh, during basketball season. And if you're familiar at all with the traffic in uh, Southern California, especially the traffic between the Inland Empire, where we were, in Riverside, Loma Linda, La Sierra, those areas, and L.A., Inglewood, and those uh, metropolises in, uh, in, in the Los Angeles area, you know that at any given time, I don't care how well intentioned you are, you might not get to where you need to go. And so I knew that if I was going to get to the Staples Center by tip off to see the Lakers on any given evening, I had to know how to get there through the 91. I could get there through the 60. I could use the 210. I could go up to 210, come down to the 60. In other words, I had found about three or four different ways routes to get to the same destination. And the uh, advantage of this type of training is it doesn't leave you scratching your head when situations come uh, up in your local church as they will. It won't leave you frustrated or as frustrated when you need to come alongside your pastor and help him or her deal with local church situations. Because the problem with some elders and not a few pastors is that they don't know how to get under the hood when something is not working well. Uh, under the hood. I talk to my ministerial students about that quite often. That's one of our purposes as as ministry trainers. There are a lot of folk who know how to drive a car. But if you're like me, you don't know much about what's going on under the hood of a car. And so if my car stops between here and home, my only options are to check the oil or see if it ran out of gas because I cannot get under the hood and get anything done. And the same thing challenges many pastors and local elders. As long as things are going well, you're going well. But the moment something goes awry, you don't know how to get under the hood and twist this, tinker that, title that. And so you are advantaging yourself by uh, participating in all of these training events and you are blessed to be a part of a local conference that prioritizes uh, lay training. And I'm putting that word lay in quote. So you got to recognize that effective elders uh, are very intentional about their personal development. I should say the ministry development. They're developing skills. Now, what is a skill? A skill is a gift from God for his glory. In other words, there's not one person looking at this webinar who has not already been given from God via the, from God the Holy Spirit gifts that can be honed into skills. And these skills are from God. Latent skills are from God, but they should be used for his glory. A skill has to be developed. 
There are a whole lot of folk who've been uh, blessed with unusual uh, potential, but potential won't help you at all if you're not disciplining those gifts and opportunities that God has blessed you with skills. Help us focus on God. A typical example of that to me is uh, Gail Jones Murphy, excellent musician in the Florida area, grew up uh, with me in Memphis, Tennessee. A lot, her, actually, her, her uh, brother is my best friend. And when we grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, you could be guaranteed that if you ever went over to the Jones house over in South Memphis, any day, any time, day or night, at least when I went over and I was over there day and night, you could always hear Gail in the room playing scales. I mean, just incessantly to the point that when we were looking at television, when we were trying to talk, Sometimes you couldn't talk over Gail, but it was scale, 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 scales. My point is she developed the basics to the point that now she is one of the most talented and sought after musicians in the Adventist church and beyond our boundaries. And one of the reasons she's so comfortable now one of the reasons she seems to be so spontaneous and the reason she flows so well now is because she spent time early on developing her skills, honing her skills. And so when you hone your skills to that point, be it in the uh, discipline of music or preaching or whatever, it, it helps you to take the focus off of you or your possible mistakes and focus on God. You can be more creative when you have less pressure because you are prepared. I guess that's my point. And then finally, not only is skill a gift from God for his glory, skill must be developed. Skill helps us focus on God, but skill also helps us serve the church. This church, uh, perhaps uh, more than at any point in the life of the church, needs all hands on deck. I mean, these artificial distinctions between what you need to be doing as non-clergy and what clergy need to be doing with all due respect to roles and lines of authority, which we can talk about at some other point. Uh, we need everybody. Re everybody needs to be on board. Everybody needs to be on deck right now because uh, we know the times as did the sons of Issachar, and we recognize that God has been too, too gracious to us to have given us the gifts that he has given us to this church, and for many of those gifts to just lay dormant. All right? So let's move to another essential, another characteristic of effective local elders. Effective local elders prioritize their personal development. Effective local elders prioritize their personal development. I mean, you know, I can't underscore that enough. Um, I really can't underscore that enough. Listen to what Ellen White says. Our first duty toward God and our fellow beings is that of self-development, sons and daughters. Uh, is the reference. Let me say it again. Our first duty toward God and our fellow beings is that of self-development. The inference is if you're not good for you, you ain't going to be good for me. And so the best thing that you can do for your local church community, the best thing that you can do to help your local pastor is to be the best person that you can be. Identify your gifts prioritize those things that God has gifted you to do. Historically, we thought that it made sense if we had a range of, of uh, opportunities to, uh, for training to emphasize those things that we don't do well because we don't want to have weaknesses. In other words, historically, people have prioritized their weaknesses in training. But I come to tell you that I believe that what you need to do is to show up your weaknesses, but you need to prioritize your gifts and strengths because your gifts, your priorities are those things that God has placed on and in you to distinguish you from others and to build up the local church. And so our mm -hmm. first duty 
toward God and our fellow beings should be that of self-development. Self-care is the word. I've been doing some webinars about uh, self-care lately. I have not been leading them out as much as I've been um, helping to facilitate these webinars, but let me tell you something. Last week, I was on a webinar, and the title of the webinar was Am I OK? And the webinar was, um, was a feature of the Pastoral Evangelism and Leadership Council, of which I'm the president or the director, as uh, Dr. Donaldson said. Incidentally, we do plan to have our regularly scheduled uh, conference in December, depending on how things are going with the pandemic, but de December 6 through 9, we will be back in Huntsville, Alabama for our yearly conference, and we do plan to have an elders training event that 6th on that Sunday. But here's my point. We were doing, we are going to be doing a series of webinars this year leading up to our December conference because the theme this year is leadership development. It's to the point that I'm making right now. Our theme for 2020 is, is Selah, strength for the struggle. Selah, strength for the struggle. Some of you all have seen Howard John Wesley at Alpha Street Baptist use that with his congregation as a point of emphasis. And this year we are stressing the fact that, um, as Ellen White said, we've got to prioritize self-development because as I went through this webinar this week that Dr. DeAndrea Jackson uh, led out in and several others were participating in, it was clear that most of us, including myself, are not okay. We are not okay with the, the, the being bombarded by all of these pressures and responsibilities and, and things that are going on during this pandemic and funerals haven't stopped since this pandemic started. Divorces haven't stopped since this pandemic started. Pain hasn't waned since this pandemic started. In other words, while we're navigating this uh, new normal caused by this COVID-19 pandemic, all of the traditional problems and issues continue to roll on. And so uh, the reason I'm emphasizing self-care is because there is this idea that some people unfortunately have that your Christianity, your Christian experience is going to isolate you, insulate you uh, from a lot of these emotional issues. The devil is a lie. The reality is we need to give each other permission to seek help. And I ain't just talking about spiritual help. The reality is for a lot of people, they need to start with the mighty counselor, and then the next counselor they need to go to is the one that's going to charge you by, by the hour. I said that. I meant that. I'm going to say it again. You need and I need to give people permission to seek professional help if that is what is appropriate and that is what's necessary, But it because it does not negatively uh, reflect on your uh, Christianity. It does not negatively uh, in, uh, reflect on you as a Christian. Let me move on. Three keys to Christian maturity. What can we do spiritually during this pandemic season to make sure that we're continuing to strengthen ourselves spiritually? First of all, let's, let's prioritize consistent personal devotion. That's my mantra. Whenever I do a presentation, I talk about the value of these three keys to Christian maturity and consistent personal devotion is uh, probably the most neglected one of the three, because if you're not, if you're like me, there are always things that are on your calendar, always items on your agenda. And at times we can overlook our foundation, our core. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's that that's the term now of the core. You got to strengthen your core because if your core is not strong, it's going to impact everything else about you physically. And the same thing can be said about our devotional life. If our devotional life is weak, it's going to make every other issue and area of our spirituality weak. You can do you. 
uh, you don't get brownie points for making this hard. And so I, 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 I've tried a lot of different things. Many of you have tried different approaches. Some work well, some don't work as well. Um, for me, I got a little taste of ADD. So whenever I'm going at it, I'm going at it hard. And so I'm reading and reading and reading, whatever I'm reading. And, uh, but I did have to make a distinction, as you do, between the type of study that I do for my own personal growth and edification and the study I was doing for professional uh, responsibilities. You need to make sure that you're strengthening your core spiritual. That can be done through things you hear, books that you read, online instruction, sky's the limit. So the first key to Christian maturity is consistent personal devotion. The second key to Christian maturity is cell membership. C-E-L-L -L membership. Now, don't get confused by the cell. I just mean community. Uh, uh, what's that? Ecclesiastes 4, I believe. Two are better than one, for there's a good reward for their labor. A threefold, a threefold cord is not uh, easily broken. I think that's Ecclesiastes 4, as the preacher said, it's in there. The point is, you and I, will be made stronger as we understand the value of relationships, of community. And even though we are socially distancing ourselves appropriately, we're going to have to be very intentional about making sure that we seek out community. That community can be provided by uh, people who are in our inner core, our, uh, family members and our, our neighbors that we are comfortable and confident socializing with. We need to continue to uh, cultivate those community relationships during this pandemic because we are created as community. I don't want to put a, too fine a point on this, but God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. We are created in the image of God. The, 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 it, it would seem to me that since we were created in community, that we function best in community. The point is, there is something that you can bring to me insofar as my personal development. And there are things that I can bring to you to help your personal development. A, a great example is accountability. Accountability is something that we only, and listen, I'm talking to local elders, and these are principles for the new normal, but these principles are going to continue to be extremely important when we gradually regain uh, access to our local uh, uh, facilities. You got to be accountable to somebody because accountability at its core, at its core is what you and I need to understand the condition that we're really in. I use this illustration. Um, I, for a couple of, well, actually for a number of months, I had been avoiding, this a couple of years ago, I had been avoiding going to the doctor for my checkup, physical. My wife persuaded me to go ahead on and uh, get that physical. When I got the physical a couple of years ago, even though I exercised regularly, even though I felt as if all was well, when my numbers came back, when that doctor came into the office with my numbers, he had a frown on his face because my cholesterol was up. I was almost borderline uh, uh, pre-diabetic. And I couldn't understand it because I felt wonderful. And I mean, things, I mean, I was exercising consistently. But when the doctor gave me a count, when he brought the numbers, the numbers don't lie. And Christians should provide accountability to each other. You know, everybody's fine when they're looking in the mirror and talking to themselves or singing in the shower. The reality is we need to have people around us who are close enough to us and care enough about us to give us the real deal. And so uh, we only get accountability, that type of accountability, when we are prioritizing community. But let me move, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was uh, pastoring one of my churches. This was in Phoenix City, Alabama. And uh, I, was, I was talking about the importance of 
of uh, of uh, accountability and cell membership and community. And I had my biggest problems with my local elders. My local elders were like me. I don't really have a lot of interest in small groups and support groups or what. I'm I'm really really as rugged and individualist as the comic books say, and that's to my own detriment. But I told my elders, brothers, we need uh, to stress connections and community. And one of my elders, I think it was my head elder, said, well, pastor, I don't get that because I got Jesus and that's enough. I said, man, that's a song. That ain't real life. <clears throat> I got Jesus and that's enough. That's the problem with a whole lot of us. We don't really understand and acknowledge the depth of our personal and our emotional issues because we are not listening to people who care enough about us to tell us who we really are. Let me move. Three keys to Christian maturity, consistent personal devotion, self-membership. The last one, just for point of uh, purposes of alliteration, is celebration. In other words, you need to worship. Yeah, I know that if you're like me, you're probably kind of sick, all these online worship services because it doesn't give you the added benefit of community. But there's something incredibly important about worship online or important, small or large, because in the context of worship, corporate worship, God does certain things that uh, you can't get when you're just by yourself. Corporate worship, I should be clearer. When I talk about celebration, I'm talking about corporate worship. And notice how things expand for your Christian maturity. You start with consistent personal devotion. That's just you and God. You buttress that by cell membership, which expands to you and other people. And then beyond that, you have celebration, which is you in a more corporate uh, structure, structure, setting, uh, because the structure is, in, uh, is really inconsequential to me. You just need to have more than one or two people every now and then to tell you how good God is to them. And then your mind is saying, it is no secret what God can do. If he did it for him, he can do it for me. That's the advantage of the maturity. That is the maturity that we gain through celebration. All right, let's move. What is another characteristic of effective elders in this new normal? Effective local elders, look at this now, are called and elected. Let me look at my time. All right, got about 15 minutes before the questions, I guess. Effective local elders are called and elected. What do I mean by that? In the Bible, the word call is often used to refer to belonging to Christ and partic participating in his redemptive work. And so in reality, each of us is called into the ministry at the point that you baptize that has been your uh, uh commencement that's the word i'm looking for when you are baptized into a local church if you're baptized i should say into the body of christ that is your commencement that is your commencement for the gospel ministry um the eldest challenge at times is and this is not just the elders dilemma when you got a lot of things that are asked of you, at times it's kind of hard to prioritize on what you consider to be the most important things. I know how it is. And one of the things I've heard consistently from local elders is at times they feel overwhelmed by their responsibilities because so many people are doing so little that they just gap, I shouldn't say just gap fillers, they end up being gap fillers. And I just, you know, I just say, I don't want to be a legalist about this call to the ministry. You have been called to serve as a local elder in your local church. And that call is essentially to take up the work of Christ where you are. In other words, do what you need to do until you can do what you want to do. As local churches, large and small, there are a lot of things for us to do. This is not a perfect world. Uh, as Paul said, who didn't consider his primary call to be evangelist, he said, I had to do the work of an evangelist. And at times there's so much stuff that needs to be done at our local churches that you might not be doing exactly what you like to do, but just keep doing what you need to do. Work well you are until he gives you other instructions. And when you walk in God's, this is important. It's very important. And this is somewhat of an aside uh, in that, now I'm talking about how a person can literally determine 
God's will is for his life or her life. I get that a lot from my students. The most simple, the, the, I should say, um, it's, it's simple, but it's not. Uh, my first step would be to understand Ephesians 2.12, 2, which basically says that when you walk in the purposes of God, you, go right, we'll, you will walk right into your calling and purpose. In other words, read Ephesians 2. I don't have time. And that passage essentially tells us that uh, God created works for us to do even before he created us. And when we walk in the will of God, we walk into his purpose for us. And so all of this comes together for me to underscore again, don't spend too much time worrying about uh, being out of your lane. If there's a zillion things to do at your local church, just work at what you can do until you really want, you get to the point where you can work at what you want to do. You are called and elected. Let me get off of this quick. I'm almost done. What do I mean by you being called and elected? Let me put this up. A call is God initiated. Boy, I tell you, Gene, you got to call me back, man, because I got to break this down. I like this. This is because a lot of questions come up about this. A call is God initiated. An election is human confirmation of that uh, God initiated call. What do I mean? I mean that if you've been a member of a local church for any period of time, all things being equal, some people just get drafted. But in the best circumstances, people have seen you, observed you, connected with you, and they have sensed a call on your life. And so this call that God has initiated is now confirmed by your election uh, to the position of local elder at your local church. Now, that's in a perfect world. Sometimes we just get drafted. Uh, but again, as I said, if you keep moving in God's will, he clears up a lot of these things. But I will say here, the reason I wanted to talk about these distinctions between being called and elected is that it's important to be both called and elected because it is incarnational. The most effective means for ministry is this divine combination of God calling and us electing. God said it, we heard it. God gifted, we confirmed it. There are a lot of folk who call themselves, and over a course of time, the church can kind of tease that out. The divine will provide the power for ministry. But the human provides the relevance. You need, mo you need both. You need both. David, for instance, was, was uh, anointed by, David was called, let me put it in the terms that we're discussing. David was called by God 10 years before he was elected. But God, he, he, was, he was as much a king then as he was when he wasn't functioning as king. It just took some time for the call and the election to connect. Saul, on the other hand, was elected and he wasn't called. And so you got people in both circumstances. I don't want to belabor the point. You get it. You got to be called and elected. Now, moving quickly to, yeah, there we go. Effective local elders are committed, committed, committed. Um, I like the word committed because it's committed. Is, no, that's commission. I'm about to go. You see, I'm about to chase some rabbits. Effective local elders are committed. They are committed to Christ. They are committed to the care of the church. And they are committed to the community. As a matter of fact, I'm going to close out our time talking about our commitment to the community. But let me start uh, with this first level. Um, I can't really say strongly enough how much this first level fuels and influences everything else that you do in the church. The church is essentially a Christian organization. And so if your commitment is not first to Christ, it just begs the question, how do you expect for anything to come out of your, quote, ministry? I do a lot of evangelism. That's actually my primary responsibility here on campus. Um, I teach church growth. I teach evangelism. I teach uh, black worship and Christian liturgy. And one of the things I found out years ago is that in these areas where people are struggling uh, for church growth, it's often because the members are not really the least bit 
prioritizing the people that God prioritized. And there's a reason for it. Uh, you cannot, I believe, effectively share the gospel if the good news is not good to you. I said something right there. Let me say it again. You will be ineffective in sharing the gospel if the good news is not good to you. And by extension, everything that you do in a local Christian church is going to be influenced by your relationship with Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. There's not one among us perfect in that sense, not totally mature. We are all uh, projects. And uh, I tell you, there's a lot of uh, room for growth from the pulpit to the pew. But be along that continuum. Respect the need for growth. Take seriously those issues that uh, you know that you need to shore up. So number one, you need to be committed to Christ. Number two, you need to be committed to the care of the local church, which is your responsibility as a local elder, combined with those deacons and deaconesses and other leaders in your church. You need to be committed to the care of the church. And you're going to have to be creatively committed in this new normal. Uh, I wanted to give you some overarching principles in this presentation, but I'm going to tell you about some resources as I close out that I think would be helpful to you. As a matter of fact, let me say this right now before I forget, because I already forgot it three or four times. There are some resources that I need to get to you. Uh, I'm just saying this. Somebody can put it in the chat field because I'm not looking at the chat field, and my administrative assistant is not on. If you would type the word or text the word Wilson, Text the word Wilson. Text the word Wilson to 33777. That's the number. 33777. And type the word Wilson. It will give me your email address, and I can connect some resources to you that I think would be very helpful. I'll say that again in a minute. So you got to be committed to Christ. You need to be committed to the care of the church. And finally, and I'm going to close out with this, you and I need to be committed to the community because effective local elders, to the extent that they can, have to be committed to the care of the community. Well, what, what do I mean by that? Well, we're seeing it now because our communities are in absolute crisis. I've, I have um, been to a couple of protests and expressed my concern about uh, Floyd and ongoing police misconduct. A lot of folk, uh, I believe, accurate in saying that this is different. This is different. Because in my estimate, I've never seen this many Anglos on the front lines as I have, as I have had, as I have in the past. There is, it seems to me, a window of opportunity to make some significant changes in our communities and in our church, for that matter. But uh, we got to take advantage of it. Um, I let me tell you this quickly. I'm going to be gone. I, I can finish with this. This is my last slide, incidentally. Then I'm going to open up for questions in five minutes. In uh, 1998, it's talking about the need for you to get involved in the community. In 1998, I was pastoring in Riverside, California, a young lady by the name of Taisha Miller. <clears throat> Some of you are familiar with a young lady, 19 years old, driving, had a flat tire. She was trying to change a flat and uh, she had a seizure. So she uh, was in a car waiting for some help for a flat tire. But while she was in the car, she had a seizure. Somebody called the police. She was foaming at the mouth. She had a gun on her uh, seat uh, for protection because she was in a dark area. Well, when the police tried to get her attention, they said she went for the gun. They shot her 23 times, four times in the head, the whole city exploded. I was out of town, but when I came back, they pulled together, they being the uh, religious groups, parachurch organizations, Nation of Islam, everybody got together. Uh, and that's what tragedy will do in the community. It will pull you together. And they asked me, would I be the uh, steering committee chairman, the person who could liaison between the community and the media and whatnot. And I did that for about three years. It it forced my local church. Don't get me wrong. We had a desire to be involved in the community. 
But that tragedy was a wake up call because there had always been challenges with law enforcement in the Riverside area, but people, they were very, very slow about acknowledging it. But when that girl got shot like that by those police officers, it exploded. So listen, for two years, Department of Justice, regularly in my uh, community, uh, for two years, every Monday night, the uh, Department of Justice held a, uh, uh, a fact-finding, community fact-finding exercise in my local church. People were coming and telling their stories about mis police misconduct. Long story short, at the end of that two-year period, some tremendous things happened. Federal government forced a consent decree on the police department to force them to invest, invest $22 million in uh, just revamping the police department. Much more aggressive minority recruitment, civilian review board. That's another thing some of you all know to be very important. Not only did they establish a civilian review board in Riverside to monitor uh, police misconduct, but it has subpoena power, something that they couldn't ignore. Uh, I can say a lot of other things, but the thing that I, that I like more than anything else was that 20 years after that incident, no similar incident had happened, which is to say that our local churches got involved in our communities and made a difference. The folk that go to Loma Linda, La Sierra, who come up and down to 91, they are safer because of what our churches did. And I think that every local church, large or small, needs to take seriously its responsibility to connect with the community. If I got a minute, I got a minute. Let me see if I got a minute. I ain't got to my hoop yet. Yeah, I got two. That was for Gene. Two minutes. Let me tell you one of the, if not the greatest um, blessing I got out of my involvement in the community. Being the director of that steering committee that was trying to bring peace to the community brought me into contact with a number of ministers and imams and, and folk from different faith traditions. I did a television broadcast on the uh, court TV. It was in Burbank. They sent a limousine to Riverside, California, where my church was located, and uh, to pick up me and uh, three other faith leaders. And one of those three faith leaders was a gentleman who was the pastor of the largest Pentecostal church in that community, along with uh, a Baptist preacher and, some, and another. Did the interview. As we were coming back from Burbank, and they were dropping us off at my church, the Pentecostal pastor leaned over to me and he said, Doc Wilson, let me ask you this. So why don't you speak in tongues? And... Uh, I mean, it was just out of the blue. But these are like four brothers, Christian leaders just talking, and this must have been burning him. Well, in my mind, I'm thinking, this is the pastor of the largest Pentecostal church in the, in the Inland Empire, and he's asking me in front of other faith leaders what my understanding of glossolalia or tongues is. You could not have asked for a better opportunity to witness than the opportunity I got right there. This brother's congregation was 4,000 members and growing, but he was sincerely asking me my opinion about something that was very central to their faith tradition. And my point is, he never would have asked me that question if we hadn't had a relationship. And so I told him, here's my point. There are certain things that we will only accomplish as local churches when we get deeply involved in our communities, deeply involved. The power of lament is basically saying when something happens in your community, before you give advice, just go shut up and cry. Go with them and cry. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything initially, just cry. And then the need to network is something I already talked about. And the story of what local churches can do, I just gave that to you. And uh, I am, at the end of my time, I'm getting old. I can't talk as long now. So, uh, Dr. Jean or Sister Hewitt, you can come back in and let me know when to stop talking because I could keep going if I need to. Dr. Jean, we do have a few questions in, in the chat. Um, first of all, thank you for what you shared so far. It's been great. Um, you mentioned a little earlier on 
about the need for our elders to develop their skill sets so that they can be creative and responding to the needs of their church. Um, and it's more so a comment about sometimes our elders find that the pastors are a little intimidated, can be intimidated by some of the gifts they possess. So how do, how can they navigate maybe having a pastor who may um, not be as supportive of their gifts because of their own insecurities? Yeah, I, I, I bet if I had a dime for every time I heard that question, which I believe to be a sincere question, and it is a problem, uh, more or less a problem depending on who the elder is and who the local pastor is. And so most of this is relational. Relational. Um, I know that I'm going to be doing some things in the future, and I would talk about lines of authority and the pastor's pastor being uh, the local elder, but uh, I, I tell you, this is not easy. One of the reasons it's not easy is because historically, I believe our church has really not taken seriously the New Testament model for the responsibility of local elders. And for that reason, it has, uh, it has put local pastors in a role that has really been debilitating to them and their, and their families. And it has put local pastors and local elders at time in an adversarial uh, relationship. And I would just simply say to you, uh, for every insecure pastor I've met, I probably met about five insecure elders because I do this as much for elders as I do for pastors. And so there's going to have to be a coming together. Um, we're helping by teaching pastors uh, as quickly as we can uh the response the roles and responsibilities and lines of authority natasha let me let me let me turn to some somebody just mentioned this let me share my screen again one time can i do this because along yes, this line yeah. of training let's see if i can get back to it uh come on there it is okay look at this there there have been a number of people who've been asking about training and i want to make and i forgot about it all i forgot about it earlier for the last four or five months we have been um, can I get this thing? Uh, why am I not progressing this thing? Oh, there it is. For the last few months, we have been uh, engaging elders three times a month through a new organization that we call the Elders of Excellence Fellowship. This is to this question about training. Every month, we have three webinars. The webinars involve basic elders training, I just gave you an example of some of the things we deal with. The next webinar deals with preaching. That deals with people whose responsibility goes more toward public speaking. And the third one deals with, with uh, speaking. One deals with preaching, one deals with speaking. And so we do a minimum of three webinars a month. As a matter of fact, if I can progress, uh, some of y'all need to register now because next Tuesday, we are going to be doing a webinar entitled Ellen White and Race. Dr. Howard Weems, who is the director of the E.G. White Estates here at Oakwood, is going to be doing our next webinar on Ellen White and Race. I think the one after that is 10 Secrets to a Successful Speech. And then the next one after that is, well, you see some of the ones we've done already, How Black is the Bible, uh, Keys to Effective Preaching. Let me get back to, to you. I'm just saying that if you would Contact me again by uh, putting the word Wilson, three text Wilson to 33777, 33777. I will get you the information so that you can become a part of the Elders of Excellence Fellowship because we're going to run a special for Allegheny East. I'm sorry, Latasha, but my point is relationships, relationships, and then a better understanding of the lines of authority. The local pastor has imputed authority. Uh, I mean, that's, he comes or she comes to the church with a certain level of authority. It's imputed, um, much like justification. I don't want to draw too line to, 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 to uh, find a point, but the local elder has imparted authority. And I would argue that when a local pastor comes into a church setting, that pastor is the aspirational leader because those local elders, if they've done a good job, have actually more authority than the pastor has. 
which is all the more reason that we need to forge these relationships, deal with these dysfunction, dysfunctions so things can roll on. All right, thank you for that. You spoke earlier about the the call of the elder from God and then the election process that come, which serves as kind of the human confirmation of that call. Um, the question came up, how do we know that an elder is called if sometimes there's meddling in the election process? Um, yeah, there's always meddling in the election process, positively or negatively. That's called humanity. There's no straight line from God's call to a person being elected, and there's no election that's free from, from, from human influence. And so let's be real, real, real. Did I say real? No, I said real, real, real clear that there's no such thing as a straight line from God's call to a person's election. Having said that, um, I think that like um, David, there are times when local elders will labor in obscurity or in frustration because the people that they've been called to, for whatever reason, don't acknowledge that they have been recipients of the call. And so I would say to a local elder that in that setting, there is nothing that keeps you from functioning as a local elder whether or not you are given that specific responsibility. I'm not saying that you can function as a local elder in, uh, you can, res you can, I'm not saying that you can function as an official local elder in that local church until you are elected, but you can certainly uh, minister at the hospital. You can uh, speak encouraging words where you can. We are never at a loss for opportunities for people to go to their hospitals, sing, preach, encourage. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is that I get it. I get, and another reason I get it is because since I have been out of the quote pastorate and into academia, I have intentionally uh, sat myself down at the feet, so to speak, of local pastors all of whom are younger than I am, much less experienced than I am. I see the dynamics in these local churches, but I'm absolutely convinced that the only way out or the, one of the most prominent ways out is just Christian relationships. And sometimes it takes time. Well, Pastor, Pastor um, did briefly two things. One is uh, Dr. Wilson, uh, I download Wilson 33777 and it keeps coming up uh, as a realtor uh, throughout the whole thing, and I can't seem to. to I'm not set up a problem. So, so, why don't you email me? I'm glad you said that. Well, as a matter of fact, Jay Wilson, you all can put it in the chat feature. Because a lot of people are getting through, so I'm seeing a lot of people texting it. So you might want to check it again. Let me say it again. You're texting the word Wilson, W I L S O N, to the numbers 33. Seven seven seven. Now, yes, gotcha. So let me give you my. Let me give everybody my email address, and I'm going to see it immediately. If you can't catch me, uh, yeah, Jason Jones says he just got through. My email address, and keep this: the letter J Wilson. The letter J Wilson. J Wilson at Oakwood.edu. J Wilson at Oakwood.edu. Okay, the second, the, the next, next thought I have uh, briefly. Uh, oh, uh, there are individuals within, uh, and you spoke to this briefly, there are individuals within uh, our denomination who feel that we as black uh, uh, people or people of color should not be uh, speaking out against the atrocities that are happening in, not just uh, in, 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 our, in, in America as far as uh, black people are concerned. And so I, I, I have odds with that because for so long, uh, uh, there are individuals who feel that uh, we should, we, and, that, and that, what I'm trying to say is, we have sat on the sidelines as Adventists and we have watched people uh, bear the burden of the cases that have happened to us down through the years and we reap the harvest. But in reality, we haven't done anything at all. And it speaks to the fact that you have said we should be a part of the community and go out and, and 
be a part and 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 allow ourselves to be uh, heard in those communities so we can come back and, and make those adjustments within our own church. Right, right. I agree, 100%. Read the Bible, Spirit of Prophecy, very encouraging words about our involvement and, and the extent that we need to go. Okay, Dr. Wilson, some more questions from the chat. You mentioned the dilemma of elders having to fill in the gaps a lot of the time. Um, do you have any strategies for kind of help helping them pull others along or encouraging others to help them fill in the gap? Yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, baptize more people would be my first suggestion. <laughs> the, I'm not. And let me tell you something. I, of course, again, my major responsibility and one of my primary gifts is evangelism and church growth. I am absolutely convinced that the lion's share of the people who are going to build churches, sing in our choirs, administer our local churches have not been baptized yet. Let me say that again. Our help is in our harvest. And when we're not intentional about growing our churches at the rate, speed, and the extent that God has ordained, we are not receiving people that God intends to be functioning in our churches right now. So one of our issues is we need to be much more intentional about expanding our churches because there's a practical benefit. You can get some help. But beyond that, um, some of this is a pastoral response. Uh, yeah, it is a pastoral responsibility, but it's also um, there are pastors who do a better job of connecting the mission and the vision for the local church to the responsibilities of a local church member in a way that make them more appealing. Uh, I'm not laying blame totally on the pastors, but I'm saying that the, that is another area that, um, that we're trying to uh, help pastors shore up. My wife is the director of development at Oakwood. And when I look at the way my wife raises money, and I look at the way my wife um, raises interest among people, I see a lot that we could be accomplishing if we were much more intentional about the way we forged our mission statements and connected our, vis our, our, our mission and our vision statements to the responsibilities of people. And some of those, some of those are just practical skills that need to be learned. But uh, that whole gap filler, that is a complaint that is timeless. So, uh, you know, I'm praying for you. Thanks for that. Um, as we see sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, in pastoral ministry, um, you know, with female pastors entering, um, some of our female elders are experiencing some of the same challenges with being accepted by their congregations. Um, how, do you have any strategies for how our female elders can navigate um, some of those biases? Yeah, it's just a matter of time. I think that church history has really made me uh, confident that it is absolutely a matter of time. The more members are exposed to female leadership, the more comfortable they are because they recognize, even if they reluctantly recognize the, uh, the deficiencies that uh, female leadership shore up. Uh, and so, you know that that is such that is that is such an interesting and challenging question because i you know i hate to sound like a broken record but from my experience most of the challenges that i have wrestled with in my local church have been relational and uh i'm from memphis and just little common sense approaches to the way you engage people with respect, even though you disagree with them. Learning how to disagree with people without demonizing people. Being patient. The problem is common sense ain't as common as it used to be. And so it, some of these things are soft skills. Theologically, my um, position is that this church I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to get into any a real um, belabored discussion on women in ministry. But I do think, at some level, we discriminate against women. But having said that, I ain't, that's for another day. I think that we are uh, we we are in great need 
of the gifts and the talents and the temperament of different women, of women when they come alongside us and our responsibilities as leaders, as leaders. And a lot of this is just relational. It's just a matter of time. Great. Thank you for addressing that. Um, also received a question about elders who may feel called to pastoral ministry, but may be a little nervous about making that transition or people accepting um, that call that they feel they have. How, how do they navigate those thoughts? Please email me. <laughs> Please email me. I do this a lot. As I said, my passion is lay leadership training. And you see that I have a passion for elder stream. But let me say this. I think that if you have a call to the pastoral ministry, that your gifts will not only make room for uh, themselves, but people over time will begin to affirm those things that, that God has given you. But it's still an inexact science. And so if you have an interest in or passion for pastoral ministry, then there's some things that we can do to help tease out uh, the reality of that. Uh, and to tell you the truth, it might be expensive, but there are a lot of things that we're really not clear about until we just kind of kick the tires, put yourself in a position to do the work of a pastor as you're doing as a local elder. See if it feels comfortable. Uh, see if people affirm you. Uh, if a person has a gift, you better believe all things being equal, people are going to begin to affirm that gift. And uh, so call me, Check, I should say email me. Okay, great. Yeah. How can we stop operating as a pastor-centric church? Or do you think we need to stop operating that way? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that, uh, I think, well, of course, it, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming I understand <clears throat> what you mean by pastor-centric churches. I would say that uh, there are appropriate roles for pastors to, um, and lanes for pastors to, to navigate. Same for non-pastors. I think this whole issue of authority is, uh, is something that we don't study enough. And I have a separate, actually, I don't generally do it, but when we're doing elders training, and if you're a part of this elders, this is a club, every, every question that you have raised is a subject for the Elders of Excellence Fellowship. If we've not covered it, we're going to cover it. Women in ministry, uh, the role of the local elder, uh, a conflict resolution, tensions between the local pastor and local elder. But let, let, me, let me just say that I think that um, some of this is generational. It's much less an issue for my kids than it was for my contemporaries. Uh, I think this this uh, skewed understanding of the role of the minister and the, and, and the relationship to the local elder is doing more damage to the local pastor than it is to the local elder. And I say, uh, without fear of contradiction, that I am seeing a gradual change. And, you know, um, some people just do what they, 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 they do what they've been taught, elders and pastors, and we continue to teach biblically and I think slowly but surely, especially as the benefits are uh, being experienced, people begin to move more freely into appropriate lanes. Okay, thank you. We're, we're wrapping up the questions. Uh, you mentioned later in your presentation about the importance of being involved in the community and obviously the racial unrest that we're under right now. Do you have some specific suggestions as to what um, the churches should be doing? Yeah. Um, how they can uh, rally together to do something. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Let me go back to a couple of points that I didn't really expand on. I think that you, you need to prepare. The best time to make a friend is when you don't need him. Let me, let me say that again. The best time to forge a relationship is when you don't need that relationship. And by that, I mean our local churches need to engage communities now because the time to engage a community is not in crisis. 
people look at you, and this happened in Huntsville. I was with a minister at a rally when a, when, when a distraught mother pointed in his face and said, where were you when we had problems, when my kid was being shot? Where were you? You were rallying for Floyd, but you were nowhere to be seen. My point is, uh, we need to get involved now. Incrementally, we need to get involved now. It doesn't really de uh, depend on the size of your church. We got to get involved now. Now, what I would do as a local church is to get involved incrementally. Uh, the first uh, thing I would do when tragedy hits the community is not offer advice, but the, the, but the ministry of presence. Come alongside them and cry. Just shut up and cry. They ain't listening to you. You don't have credibility if you've not been involved or engaged. So just come and the ministry of presence will build credibility. But beyond that, I think beyond the uh, lament, that's, the, that's what it is, lament, the value of lament. But I cannot underscore enough the need for us to connect with churches, organizations, parachurch organizations who have been involved all along. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to go to people who've already been engaged in the community. We will, re we will receive instruction. We will have credibility. And I don't want to uh, under, under, undervalue the uh, importance of Adventist churches getting together, coming out of our silos and getting together to rally, to march, to protest peacefully. Uh, we, when I was pastoring, we made sure that we had representatives on city council. And so those are the types of things that I think any local church can do to kind of raise its profile in the community. Thank you. One last question. Um, we thank you for providing your email address if others should have more. Uh, what are some mentorship strategies and tips for younger elders, like between the ages of 20 and 30, to successfully lead older congregations? It's like reverse mentoring. Say that again, Latasha. I want to be sure that I understood the question. Pretty much, what are some strategies that some of our younger elders can use to minister to older members who may not necessarily respect their leadership just yet or, or do not relate to their leadership style. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I tell you. Now I got a PhD in this, and this is the advantage of growing up in Tennessee. Um, the reality is I have never had an experience with a senior citizen that didn't respect my kindness. They might not respect my opinion, understand my perspective, but kindness is a common language. And so it's the soft skills at this point, I believe, that are going to open up opportunities for you to uh, have your role respect. You got to come alongside folk. You got to speak to folk. You got to talk to folk. You got to know folks' names. You got to remember where they live. You might not need to uh, physically, you might not be able to physically connect with them, but drop them a line, drop them a text, be at the funeral, be at the, un, under better circumstances, be at the funeral, be at the wedding, be at these uh, uh, occasions when you can connect because we will never speak the same language theologically, but the language of love is consistent, unmistakable. And that, I'm gonna tell you something, that got me over more than anything else as a young pastor. I didn't know nothing, but I did know how to respect people, how to speak to people, and how to show love until I could build some credibility. That's what I think you need to do. Awesome, thank you. And thank you so much for not just your presentation, but taking the time to answer these questions. We really appreciate it. One more thing, Natasha, let me say it. Let me say this is an unsolicited plug. Y'all listen to me. You cannot stop with these, these isolated training events. We have put together the Elders of Excellence Fellowship so that you can get this three times a month if you want to. And even if you can't be physically at the webinar, you will have unlimited access to the tapes. And I'm gonna uh, communicate with everybody to let you know what we're doing for the Allegheny East Elders. And so make sure you send me your information either to my website I should say my email or to 
777 Wilson. The other thing I'm going to do, uh, Natasha, I don't know if you're responsible for this, but I talked to Dr. Donaldson. I will just get the uh, sign up list from this webinar and just send out the information, just layer it like that. Sorry about that. Yeah. Sure, that's fine. Well, thank you, Dr. Dr. Wilson. Yes, sir. Jesse, my friend, I appreciate this very, very much. It's been so informative. And uh, w one of the things that we might be able to do too is uh, uh, we can uh, have uh, the individuals uh, connect with Latasha and she can get all of the uh, kind of uh, advertisement information that you were sharing out to all of our uh, elders. So we can, we can save you from looking at 500 or 200 or 150 emails trying to, to, to answer that. All right, but listen, man, uh, this was rich. Uh, we'll have to do it again. Obviously, uh, there's a wealth of uh, information that you shared with us and we could, we could see that there's a reservoir still left and uh, we need to be able to tap into some of the uh, other things that you might want to be able to say to our elders. Uh, we believe here at Al in Allegheny East that we have some of the finest elders, man, who have really been a great blessing to all of our uh, churches. And so um, we are thankful for what you have contributed to them. And uh, we believe that uh, our paths will cross uh, again. Thank you again, man, and uh, appreciate you. Um, I'm going to uh, reach out to any of our administrators, if Elder Fordham or Elder Palmer or Elder Martin are uh, uh, still with us. We'd like to give you an opportunity uh, to uh, just say a, a few words, both to our presenter and to our elders who are here. Yes, uh, Dr. Donaldson, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I know Elder uh, Palmer was on, and, and I, I believe Elder Martin was on, but I just want to say uh, a, a deep thank you. Uh, my express my gratitude to Dr. Wilson for what he's presented, and that's just uh, just a small fraction of what we can gain from these types of webinars or seminars. I just wish that when I was coming through as a young pastor, that these types uh, of training or teaching experiences would have been available to me. You know, you have to learn some things through the hard knocks, but here mm -hmm. uh, you have a prescription here that he's given that how to be an effective minister or elder will work for pastors as well. I, I, I just think it was rich and, and I'm thanking you, Dr. Donaldson, for inviting Dr. Wilson and your other guests uh, to share with us, especially during these times. As you said, these are unusual times, and so we need unusual skills and un unusual gifts. And I believe that the Lord has given our elders just what they need to accomplish their ministry. Amen, amen. I also want to affirm, um, can you guys hear me okay? We can, uh-huh. Okay. I also want to affirm um, Dr. Wilson and what he has shared this afternoon. I want to thank, uh, again, Dr. Donaldson for putting together an outstanding elders retreat or elders, uh, what is, no, not retreat, advanced. what was the word? <laughs> advance, elders advance, amen. I don't wanna say retreat, we're not, on the, we're not on the run, we're not running away from nobody, we're on the advance, amen. But um, thank you, thank you, Elder Donaldson, thank you, uh, Dr. Wilson, um, for your uh, sage advice, we appreciate it. And um, I don't know if you wanna give, um, Elder Martin, a chance to say I'm just something else. I want to come back and say Elder Donaldson, but I'll leave Elder, Elder Martin to say a few words. All right. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let's see. Elder Martin, you with us? All right. Well, let, let me let me come back, Elder Donaldson. Um, I just want to say thank you to our elders for the way that they are holding down the fort um, during this pandemic. Um, as we are not in our churches um, and physically, um, thank you for what you are doing. Um, we do uh, enlist your help um, and your assistance as we continue to hold down the fort. 
Um, we don't know how long we will be in this uh, environment, um, but this does not appear that we'll be coming out of it as soon as we would like. And so we uh, do enlist your assistance in uh, working through uh, these virtual worship services. Um, it's not the services I'm so much concerned about as it is the uh, touch that is needed. Um, reaching out to members, you're making those phone calls, you're they make, checking on our elderly, checking on those who are most vulnerable. Thank you for what you do week in and week out, and we need you to keep up that, that solid work. That's what's keeping our churches together. That's what's uh, allowing us to grow. Um, some of our churches are actually seeing more people at prayer meeting during this time of pandemic than they saw when we were physically in the building. So we thank you for what you're doing and how you're holding down the fort. Thank you, elders. I just wanted to say that, Elder Donaldson. Um, so I just wanted to put that word out there. Thank you. Thank you so much for those comments. Uh, uh, Elder Martin, if, is, is, if Elder Martin is here, if not, uh, thank you again, Elder Palmer. We appreciate that comments. Thank you, Mr. President. We pre appreciate those comments. Um, there are a few uh, events that are going to be coming up soon. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Latasha if uh, she would uh, remind us of uh, what's coming up, uh, shortly coming to pass. Sure. Um, next weekend, can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Next weekend, we're going to have a panel discussion with our three administrators. We're going to be talking about um, how COVID-19 has impacted our conference, as well as some of the issues that are happening in our world right now. And that will be a live discussion um, streaming from our Facebook page, as well as our YouTube channel. So we invite you to be part of that live discussion next Saturday at 3 p.m. We also have another very sp special virtual experience, and that's our camp meeting, which will uh, take place June 26th through July 4th using the same channels, our Facebook page, as well as our YouTube channel. And we have a wonderful lineup of speakers. We'll be sharing more about the program that will take place during the week. But I want to let you know, it's not just uh, Sabbath services. We have um, information and seminars and preaching all week long. So we'll be sharing more information with you about that. Stay tuned for more details. And we have had questions about those who do not have the ability, don't have computers or internet access. So we're working on ways that they can still receive the message by phone if necessary. So thank you for your time and attention. Amen. Thank you again, uh, uh, Latasha, uh, for sharing that with us and for your support. Um, we're grateful for each one of our elders. We're thankful for what you're doing. And uh, one of the advantages of the, this crisis is that it's allowed us uh, to really rise to our greater selves. And as I've shared with our president, I believe uh, that uh, this is going to be one of the finest hours uh, for the Allegheny East Conference, and you're going to be a major part of uh, that success story, that effective success story for the Allegheny East Conference uh, during uh, this time. Once again, uh, uh, Jesse, man, if we were with you, we would give you all kinds of uh, hugs, man. We appreciate your ministry to us. It was a great, tremendous blessing. And uh, uh, those of you who would like to take advantage of the resources that uh, 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 Dr. Wilson uh, shared with us, um, what we'll do is we'll get the advertisements and uh, uh, send them out through our communications department if you don't uh, want to uh, contact uh, Elder Dr. Wilson uh, directly. But we can do that for you, uh, Dr. Wilson, and that way all of our elders will um, have access to that information and be able to participate in, in what you were uh, sharing. Well, uh, we're grateful again, and I'm going to uh, ask uh, Dr. Wilson, would you be kind enough uh, to uh, close us with prayer? Sure. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful time that we've had together. We thank you that long before we scheduled this webinar that you saw each person engaged and involved before Dr. Donaldson and, and the administrators 
scheduled this event. You had it on your calendar. So we thank you for connecting with us and giving us those things that we need. Help us, God, to move forward from this point because we know that we're living on borrowed time. Help us to count the years as months, the months as weeks, the weeks as days. Help us to live like any day we'll see Jesus. Thank you again for the leadership of this conference, the wisdom that you've given them. Thank you for the relationship that you've given uh, to uh, myself and Dr. Donaldson. And we pray your richest blessings upon each elder in the Allegheny East Conference. Thank you for hearing. Thank you for answering. In Jesus' name, amen.